Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to welcome you to the regular meeting for Monday, March the 21st, 2011, for the Parks, Recreation, and Community Services Commission. Could we have a roll call, please? Commissioner Bennett? Yes. Patrick? Yes. Rob Fogel is absent. Sharkey? Here. President Kahn? Here. The agenda for the March 21st, 2011 meeting was posted on the bulletin board outside City Hall on Tuesday, March 15, 2011. Item two, introductions and presentations at A, presentation by the Armenian Relief Society. My name is Sona Zinzalian from Armenian Relief Society. The Armenian Relief Society of Western USA Social Services operates under the guidance of the regional executive with 31 experienced social workers. Through our four service locations, we assist low to moderate income community members with language and culture barriers who need guidance and assistance to access services. The area social services operations are funded by eight grants, federal, state, county, city, foundation, and fundraising, which provide the community with case management, completion of forms, job placement and ESL classes for seniors and counseling. The offices are open Monday through Friday, 9 to 5, free of charge. You're lucky the main office is in Glendale. The ARS social service staff members are fluent in the following languages. Armenian, Russian, Farsi, Arabic, English, Spanish and French. The ARS social proudly serves over 50,000 clients annually through four offices. We work with the grants. We have LA County Aging Grant for seniors, LA County CSPG Grant, LA County Refugee Grant, City of Pasadena CDBG Grant, City of Glendale CDBG Grant, City of Burbank CDBG Grant, and also we provide computer-aided job search, computer basic skills such as Word and Excel workshops on man monthly basis, resume preparations, information and referrals for refugee and asylees only. ARS Social Services receives donations from foundation and other private donations and we do a lot of fundraising. ARS Social Service is working with California Lifeline Service Program to distribute flyers and inform the community of the low-cost telephone services. The major services are case management, job development, referrals, employment placements, information and referrals, medical and housing completion of forms, counseling, translation and interpretation, employment-oriented Workshops, ESL, Life Skills for Senior, General Social Service. It's not limited, but we complete all kinds of application documents for welfare, SSI Social Security, disability, unemployment, rental credit, citizenship, green card, travel passport, employment authorization, general inquiry form, renewal for green card, lost stolen green card, Low Income Housing, Section 8, Healthy Families Application for Children, Health Care Option, Taxi uh, Coupons Application, Telephones, MTI Bus Cards Forms, Job Search, Home Energy Assistant, Food Stamp, General Relief, CAPI, Jury Duty, Senior Applications for Housing, and etc. We do advocacy for our community, Transportation Assistant, and we distribute food during the holiday season, can and dry food, toys for needy children at the Christmas time. And we distribute the toys at the, during the Armenian Christmas, so they remember the Armenian Christmas is January 6th. We collaborate. We collaborate with other social service agencies, government and public or private institutions to arrange projects and programs to better serve the community in need. ARS staff participate in regular meetings for each city, county, legislative, forum, contractors at the LA County and the cities. Healthy sub meetings, in home supporting service meetings, IHSS. Collaboration with Child Care Resource Center, a caseworker from the Child Care Resource Center comes to the ARS Glendale office to help our clients with child care issues once a week. 
We collaborate with agencies that serve refugees and asylees to settle them. We collaborate with Tobacco Prevention Coalition. With the collaboration of the City of Glendale for Senior Housing and Section 8, we distribute and complete thousands of affordable housing applications for low-income families and participate to the lottery drawing at the City Glendale Hall. ARS participated in a quarterly meeting with the SAC, State Advisory Council, Council for the Sacramento, on refugee assistance and services in Sacramento through webinar and conference calls to discuss about refugees' arrival and in impact on counties, the budget, and health issue. ARS participated in a refugee summit, remembering the past, celebrating the present, and preparing for the future. The summit takes place in Sacramento, California. We are a humanitarian organization, 100 years old. Our goal is to serve, to help the needy community within our limits. Thank you very much. Did you have any questions? Were there any questions from the commissioners? Is there anything you don't do? <laughs> <laughs> really, we do everything. We have liaison between the community and the government and the public, you know, that they need our help. They call us from all the way from the airport. An Armenian came, he or she doesn't speak the language. How we can help? We tell them, put in the taxi, send it to our office so we can assess, you know. Uh, for the schools, police department, hospital, you know, whenever they need anything, we're here to help, you know. That's our mission. Now we're helping the Jap Japan earthquake, collecting donations, you know, to send to the Red Cross. Very nice. And we invite you every year, you know, the first weekend, this time it's the April 30th and May 1st, to our festival in the Glendale College, you know. Uh, it's very multicultural, you know, with the food and culture, everything. You, everybody is welcome to participate to our uh, almost the 90th Armenian ARS festival. Questions? Great. Thank you very much for coming. You're welcome. Uh, we're like a one-stop center, you know. Uh, we help the volunteer for the high school student that they have to do some volunteers, like 10, 20 hours. They come to our office, you know, and they do the volunteer, and they learn about the social service at the same time. And we're lucky... Uh, school, Phoenix uh, University sent all the social workers, major people to our uh, center to learn to become social workers and many more. Great. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Item three, commission staff comments. Any commissioners have comments? I know I have a couple. Yeah, I, um, um, last meeting we we nominated me into the Art Advisory Board. And I've also been working with Maple Park, and we've met a couple times now. We had just incredible uh, art applications, and we ended up selecting several. Uh, and the presentation will be made, I hope, to the City Council today. And they're just... More than, way more, more than I ever expected, and so we're going to have some nice art in Maple Park. Great. Were you going to congratulate Jeff? Was that what you? Okay, no, it's I'll give it to you. <laughs> You've already it's stolen the fire. Go ahead. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. That's okay. No, no, go ahead. You're on. You're on. Commissioner Sharkey, please. It's okay. We couldn't be more delighted to yes. have him move up to the seat. <laughs> Congratulations. Congratulations. Yes. Thank you. Great. Um, congratulations, and <laughs> <laughs> thanks. There are a couple other things that I'd like to mention uh, today before we start. Uh, first of all, uh, if there's any feedback or input that we have as it relates to these rains, specifically that we had yesterday up in the Duke Majin Park area, and up where the fire was, if we can get an update on that. Actually, the, uh, the foliage and the plants that were growing the last year or year and a half or so have done really well. They've held the soil. Soil has been holding. They cleaned out the debris basin 
magnificently, actually. There's just so much room down in there to hold. And the soil is being held. Uh, the the uh, large shrubs are coming back. Their roots are holding. The animals are coming back, which actually um, packs down the, grass, the, the open soil. So the Duke Majin had no problem. Actually, I had more problems in other parks where trees were just overly wet and they just snapped off either at the base or yanked out of the ground. We had one up at uh, Shoal Canyon uh, on the last rain. We had uh, it was about a 75-foot pine tree just went over. And it just, just all the roots came out of the ground, basically, and it just slowly went over like a, like, you know, Lincoln Log said. It just slowly just cracked and, and went down. We had one of Brand go down, and it snapped off at the base. So it helped to be stump ground. But I think it's in the library renovation area, so it won't be impacted as it, as it could. I would have to replant that one. But uh, right now we've had a couple up in the uh, Shoal Canyon area. Other ones go down, but they haven't been deal breaker, so to speak, in the sense that uh, we were able to clear them, get the road open, get the people in the park, out of the park, and keep it safe, at least over the weekend. So we didn't have any, any, any catastrophes or major disasters at all over this last rain, which was quite hard, a lot yeah, harder than I thought down. it was going to be. Yeah. Yeah. But I think we came out okay on so far. Great. That's great to hear. Uh, the second thing that I had is a little bit different, shifting gears here. Um, I know there was some discussion, and there's still discussion, uh, about the state and the budget and what's going to happen with redevelopment and what's going to happen with housing. The only reason I bring this up as it relates to redevelopment is as it relates to parks and how we are impacted in parks. And I asked one of the redevelopment staff people, I said in terms of our last few parks projects, what has the contribution been from the redevelopment agency? And I was surprised to learn, uh, just a couple real quick, the last few parks projects that we've had. Uh, Griffith Manor Park, uh, the redevelopment agency contributed three million dollars for this park. Uh, the Adult Recreation Center, which we are all celebrating, uh, the redevelopment agency contributed seven million dollars towards the park. Um, also proposed is the Columbus School Soccer Field which, if approved, we have allocated $3.2 million uh, from redevelopment. And the list goes on. And I'm only highlighting as it relates to parks. There's obviously a number of other issues that they contribute towards, but it truly would impact us substantially. And so I think that that's an important item to focus on is how does it relate to the budget and how does it relate to the impact to us directly. And I think we talked about that and got some updates from our staff as well on that. But I was, I was kind of surprised that the numbers were so large, quite frankly. And these are just our last few parks projects. Anyway, just some information to pass along. Looking at you. <laughs> I thought maybe Dottie was going to do this, but since she didn't, I will. The, um, Glendale Parks and Open Space Foundation is partnering with Parks and Rec to put on the first annual Run the Verdugo's 10K Run and Hike in Brand Park on May 1st. And I would just encourage everybody to check out our webpage, uh, www.runtheverdugos.com. We are getting all kinds of really wonderful sponsors for this, and I think it's going to be a really fun day. So I hope that uh, a lot of you will come out and participate. Thanks. <laughs> Did staff have any comments? Uh, President Khan, I don't believe staff has any comments unless Joanne or Gary has anything. <clears throat> Except you're absolutely right about the redevelopment funding. It will have, if redevelopment is eliminated, it will have a significant impact not only on, on capital projects but the ongoing operation of, of city government. The redevelopment funds are used to leverage the general funds, so there are a number of staff positions, for example, that uh, redevelopment funding pays for directly. So as of this moment, uh, we're still trying to stave off that uh, el elimination, uh, but I, I think they're going to be voting on it uh, again and maybe a couple more times. It's, it's resolved. Yeah, I know that, and that's why I wanted to focus just on parks. I know there are so many different things that they, they contribute towards, 
but as it relates to this arena, um, and, and now with the social service aspect that ha we have in parks as well, um, what impact will that have with the redevelopment agency potentially or possibly going away or being significantly uh, reduced in terms of their funding? Anyway, uh, okay, thank you. Item four, oral communications. I don't see any cards, so move on to item five. Item five, consent items. 5A, approval of the minutes of the commission regular meeting held on February 10th, 2011. Move that the minutes be approved. All second. Commissioners Bennett? Yes. Patrick? Yes. Rob Fogel is absent. Sharkey? Stain. President Kahn? Yes. Item 6, Business Agenda, 6A, Reports for Information Only. At 6A1, Brand Library and Art Center Renovation Project. At A, Report by Glendale Public Library staff. And at B, Impact to Community Services and Parks Programs and Services. Uh, President Khan, we do have a presentation uh, which will be made by the Library Division and or the Public Works Division. And that will be followed by a, an overview from Joanne on the potential impacts that the Brand Library Renovation Project has on the park operations at, uh, at Brand Park. Um, so. Good afternoon, President Khan, members of the Commission, Rube Golanian, City Engineer. Uh, as a way of introduction, the item being presented to you today is the Brand Library and Art Center Renovation Project. This capital improvement project is currently underway and consists of the restoration of the historic brand mansion, the reconfiguration of spaces, and upgrade of both the mansion and the 1969 section of the building to extend their useful life. This will be accomplished by targeted improvements to building systems, disabled access, and seismic retrofit. The project is led by Gruen Associates in partnership with Offenhauser Meekin Architects, the library and public works staff will jointly be managing the project from the city site. To date, Gruen Associate has completed the schematic design a phase of the project and is in design development phase. On February 16th of this year, we held a community meeting which was well received. There will also be a presentation made to the Historic Preservation Commission scheduled for March 28th and then later on to Arts and Culture Commission. It is our hope to take the recommendations to City Council sometime in late March, uh, April. With that, I'd like to introduce uh, Deborah Gerard with Gruen Associate to make the presentation. Thanks. Hi, thank you to the commissioners, to city staff, to the community for allowing us to make this presentation today. See if I am smart enough to figure this out. There we go. Uh, uh, Rubik mentioned that there's a large group of us working together. Uh, this is a listing. I won't read off all the names, but we just wanted you to be aware that we have great collaboration between the library staff, uh, public work staff, and our team, which uh, includes a whole array of consultants. Uh, the landscape architect is also my firm, um, and uh, uh, so that makes coordination very easy, and Steve Smith, who's our uh, head landscape architect, will make a portion of this presentation today as well. And as uh, Rubik also mentioned, uh, Fran Offenhauser with Offenhauser McKeel, who's a historic uh, renovation specialist. She's an architect as well, and uh, she is collaborating with us on this because of the historic aspects of this project. Uh, just really briefly, uh, this is our agenda for this brief presentation. Talk a little bit about the history of the building. Uh, talk about the renovation scope. Steve will go into greater detail on the landscape features. And I'll give you a brief overview of the costs and schedule. Uh, so the, the mansion was built in 1904, as many people probably know. Uh, added on to in 1910. And... Uh, uh, I should mention that it was turned over to the city in the 1950s, where it was turned into a library. And, uh, and then later, the art galleries, uh, the, the 1969 building was added, which houses uh, art galleries, a recital hall, and the brand studios. Uh, part of the library is also in the uh, uh, 1969 edition, so it's not 
a clean separation of the library only being in the historic mansion and other activities in the 1969 building. And that becomes uh, significant as we talk through the details of the renovation. Uh, so you are all familiar with the fact that Brand Studios is underneath uh, on the lower level of the 1969 edition. And the uh, uh, significant portion of what we're going to do, oops, sorry, a uh, significant portion of what we're going to do affects the building directly above the Brand Studios. Uh, an overview of what we're trying to accomplish on uh, this is first and foremost to preserve what we consider to be a really significant asset for the city of Glendale, which is this great building, not only from uh, the standpoint of its historic value, but also the functions that it contains within it. And uh, uh, really to, to preserve this uh, icon of Glendale is first and foremost. In addition, uh, the library, um, we plan on focus, uh, or our aspirations are to organize it uh, in a way that makes it easier for people to find their way through it, which also means getting into it. Uh, and access into the library right now is a little um, less than ideal. There's a great deal of confusion as to which doors to enter into, and that's something that we'll be uh, correcting through this renovation. That also includes access to the brand studio, so that wayfinding is vastly improved for all of the, the different activities that take place within this building. Uh, certainly modernizing the uh, mechanical and electrical systems, the air conditioning systems of the building is a significant thing to do. This building, part of it is 100 years old, parts of it are uh, almost 50 years old, and uh, it, it's time for it to be upgraded to allow it to continue to uh, serve the, the community. And also, uh, there's a seismic issue. And, and when I mentioned that we have work to do above the brand studios, it's really seismic work is, is the biggest issue. Uh, those precast panels on the outside of the building need to be better connected so that they work appropriately in, a, in an earthquake. And uh, uh, so that, that will uh, be a portion of uh, the safety improvements. There are some seismic improvements in the mansion as well that are, are very necessary. And, and I mentioned accessibility. We want to make sure the building can be uh, equally accessed by all persons. Uh, so with that, I'm going to let Steve talk a little bit more about the landscape features, and then I'll come back and finish up here. Great to be here. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, as you know, this is a very significant building in Glendale and has an important uh, character and historic feature, and it's very visible at the top of the hill. And so as we approach this project, we're very sensitive to the landscape portion of it. And because, as Deborah had described, the entrance is being modified quite significantly and being elevated, there are going to be effects on some of the existing landscape that's there. Um, also, because the interior is being upgraded and restored, much the historic part is being enriched to its original form, and the uh, gallery and, and the art center is also being improved, we feel like this was an opportunity to maximize the landscape at this point. And these two pictures show sort of an early, uh, circa mid-1900s picture of what it looked like originally. And because it was built sort of in the era of the Victorian, we know that there were many exotic plants that were brought in, which was typical of the era that people uh, brought in palms and exotics and tropicals and things like that, which um, is very much evident there. Um, the picture on the right shows it currently. Uh, we know that over the past few years that other plants and trees have been added. Uh, and as, as we visit the site, we notice, for example, on the right, the very prominent tower and the architecture is somewhat obscured by those uh, jacaranda trees that aren't very old. I think they're probably about 10 or 20 years old that are in the front. So we're going to talk a little bit about some of the things we're doing as they restore the building, but also enhancing architecture so it has a better visibility. And I'll tell you, I'm a landscape architect and a tree lover, but I'm going to talk about removing some trees. So and this affects Parks and Rec a lot, so we'll go that. Um, I'm pushing the button here. Uh, this shows pretty much the proposed modifications to the existing landscape that we're going to do. And I guess at the very top where we're going to be adding uh, handicap access parking, um, there are currently two redwood trees. And one of the redwood trees is right up against the building. And, and it's going to be affected by a new walk and a new parking stall. So we are proposing that that tree be removed. The larger one, which is in the center, is being saved so that we'll still have that redwood tree that's there. 
There's also a tree in the center of the courtyard uh, at the gallery, which the uh, library staff has recommended, if possible, could be removed, as it currently is dropping seed pods constantly on the pavement. It does not help them when they want to do outdoor events. Um, it's just a constant mess. And the tree has reached pretty much its maturity after about 50 years of being in there. And so at their recommendation, we are recommending that that be removed. And new paving is going in that whole area anyway that we're doing. Um, another significant thing that we're doing that we felt was important was along the uh, east side of the, the main walkway, the stairs that lead up, there are these younger jacaranda trees that are currently quite closely planted together. We feel that this is an opportunity to open that up now and, and restore that view to the architecture. And as I look at it, in the next 20 or 30 years, if those trees are left, they're just going to get bigger and bigger and bigger until the entire building is going to be completely obscured. Uh, if this was a different building or if it was in a park, I, you know, I wouldn't think anything about it. But because the view up the street is so important and significant, that's an important issue. There are other, a lot of other trees, a lot of other jacarandas on the site and along the perimeter of the property. Uh, so we're not really feeling like we're impacting the, the tree population there. Uh, there's also a bohemia tree, which is down at the bottom, which is not in very good shape. It's kind of leaning, got dead branches in it. And then there is a dead um, deodor, cedar, that's there, bare. And I think I can show you a photo in a minute of it. Then also on this um, south side, there are two very large old ficus trees that I think are planted originally from the 1969 building. We all know the story of ficus. The city of Glendale is not immune, like many other cities, of the root issues. These roots are really gung-ho about hitting the walls and the curbs, and so we felt like if it were possible, this would be the time with this project and this budget to remove those ficus and perhaps place new trees that would be less invasive to it as we go throughout. And so this shows you the ficus on the left side that are there. They do provide shade to the, uh, to the studio, which is important. But we feel like if we plant some new trees, that would help to do that. And currently, we can't even grow anything under there. The roots are so invasive. And you can see the white marks on the ground. Those are the roots that are all up. And this is the dead uh, deodor that's over on the right, um, just sitting there all by itself, wanting to be replaced, maybe. That red button is a OK, water. I'm sorry. So you can see the roots right there, and then, of course, the pine that's there. Um, this is the modifications to uh, continuing with them. This is the tree that's in the uh, courtyard, which I think is a hackberry. It has little black berries that drops down. It's growing right in the center of the plaza, and uh, the library staff would like very much to maximize the use of that courtyard. Uh, we're considering it eventually perhaps to become like a sculpture garden, so there could be sculptures placed out there and, and used a little more effectively as we go throughout. And this shows that, that um, a, uh, the redwood tree right here, the small one that's going to have to be replaced or be removed, this is the larger one in the back, which is right there in that circle as we go throughout. Another shot showing the uh, plaza entry. And this is the plaza area that's being completely rebuilt with new stairs, new handicap ramp as we're entering into. This is going to provide the new entrance to the, both the library and the gallery and, and the art center. And we feel like it needs to be truly presentable for such a grand building. And now that the emphasis is going to re go over to here instead of on the front porch, the uh, accessibility needs, needs to be very good. And so for that reason, there's a new ramp, handicap ramps right here, the new stairs that are right here. And then, uh, again, as mentioned before, that is uh, the bohemia that we are proposing to be re removed, and these are the jacks on this side. As you can see, you can barely even make out the library behind. It's, it's a shame because it's uh, magnificent. You finally have to get up the stairs quite a ways before you, you've, you take advantage to the, the whole thing. Um, these are some of the hardscape elements that I've already kind of referred to. As I mentioned before, the, the new entrance. This is the new stairway that's going to lead up. And we've gone through some different configurations, but we feel this is the best one. There's going to be a couple benches at the landing so that you can sit as you go up. Then you have the choice. There's no longer a step that goes up to the porch. We're discouraging that immediate access to the porch, but instead there will be a new uh, handicap accessible walkway around the front that's wide enough. The lawn, the, the grading, everything is going to be maintained pretty much historically the way it is. 
but it's going to be much more accessible. Uh, also, currently, there's a paving pattern of a stamped concrete. We feel like it came in the 70s or something, but that's going to be restored to a, a simpler paving pattern. And then the main plaza, which is called the large level entry plaza, is going to be provided. And this is, again, going to be an opportunity for the library staff to do outdoor events for receptions, for open houses and to be able to use this. Um, we are proposing perhaps a nice stone paver material that will be compatible with the architecture of the building. The grid that you see on the paving follows the same grid work of the 1960s vintage building. So we're going to maintain, excuse me, <coughs> the character of that building with that, that grid work. But the new entry f lobby, which Deborah will probably talk about, is now going to be there. So you're going to have this wonderful glassed-in entry as we come into both the library and the, uh, and the gallery. And um, let's see if there's anything else along the side here. Again, new trees are going to be planted here to replace the ficus. And we are looking at a way to provide landscape design that both complements the historical aspects of the, the old brand mansion, but at the same time maintain simplicity and elegance. And because of that, we're finding that much of the plant materials and style of the 1960s, of the 69 building, very compatible with what we do today. Simple lines, simple massing, but we are looking to leading towards more sustainability. So we have more drought tolerance in the plant materials and looking at the longevity as we go throughout. Um, these are some of the plant materials that we we are proposing. We're not completely finished yet with a planting plan, but these are some suggestions. The porch is very important. There was much effort on the architect's part to not have to put in a hand railing. The code today would normally require it if you have a certain drop at the edge of the porch. Because we're able to maintain that, we did not have to put the railing, which would have destroyed some of the character and quality. But we are putting a new myrtle hedge all around the perimeter, which would be allowed to come up about, I think, to the 24 inches. 18 inches above the porch, so it gives you somewhat an edge and keeps people from jumping off the porch, I guess. But it's going to be graded as well with a 30-inch maximum drop off the side of the porch. Then there will be some dwarf flax that will be used and Little John Weeping Bottle Brush, which is a low, about a three-foot dwarf version of bottle brush, and fern pine accents, um, as you can see. And there's a section right here showing what the hedge will look like along the side. Again, clean, simple, horizontal lines, maintaining the, 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 the simplicity of the architecture. Currently, it's got huge old um, bird of paradise that are very, very old that are kind of covering everything up on the way. And we're going to kind of simplify that as we go throughout. Um, again, some other plants that are proposed along the stairs. The banding that comes off of where the stairs are would be a, a, a bright colored flax, kind of a reddish orange that would be there. And then in between them, a natal plum, which is a low, dark green ground cover that would go between. Then we are proposing, and there's alternatives that are possible, of a new trees here, perhaps the pink trumpet tree, which I just came up with in the boulevards in Glendale today, fully in bloom, gorgeous pink uh, this time of year. They look like that. Oops, did I go the wrong direction? Um, as well as some Japanese mock orange, which is the larger ones that we're proposing down below um, that side right there. Then in the bed, it would be um, acacia redolens, which is a low ground cover. And I don't know how many of you are landscape people, but I'm, I'm rattling on about plants, but um, we're going to do that. Oh, I forgot. There's also going to be some color uh, here at the front entry of, of a dwarfed low bougainvillea, uh, like oh la la, that would give some color to the entry statement as you come into the entry. And then there's a wonderful uh, shrub that's called little ollie olive. It's like a little olive trees, but they're smaller. They stay down about three to four feet. Again, drought tolerant, sustainable, compatible with the rest of it. Go throughout. And then finally, up on the courtyard, as we're getting into the plaza connection, and also out at the ADA parking, these are some of the things that we're proposing. There are two flanking trees, sort of symmetrical, as you enter into the plaza. And these would be the... Um, Pygmy date palms, the Phoenix robolini, uh, we're looking to put a large box specimens in so they have some size and, and stra uh, st uh, stature to them as they, they come in. We feel because of the rather Byzantine style of the architecture that a, a Phoenix date palm like that would be very appropriate and, and be in keeping with it. Uh, and also in keeping somewhat with a more exotic look, there would be a sago palm back at the entry as you come in, and then some other things such as a uh, liriope in the parking lot. And, uh, and it, you, at the questions and answers, you can you know, ask me any questions you want about that. On the patio itself, we are proposing some pots to provide accents as you come into the 
gallery. Again, because the gallery has a tendency to have a very interesting contemporary art, we feel like the landscape opportunities there are also to provide texture, color, drama that would add visual interest as we come in onto the plaza. So for that reason, we're looking at pots with some foxtail agaves in there. Um, as well as uh, little dwarf Dracaena dracos. They have a very dramatic, bold leaf on them. And then underneath them, aeonium, which succulents today are very popular because they have interesting color and they're very tough and hardy and easy to maintain. This, of course, is in lieu of classic perennials or annuals that you'd stick in the pots. These are things that would live a long time, be very low maintenance. And should city staff miss a watering or whatever, they don't have to worry about it because they're, they're very, very tough. We also have some small uh, cape rush that's going to run along the side here. And then little low hedges. And most of the hedgy materials is lowish. It's about three to four feet. We're not doing anything that's big and tall. It's going to cover up. And as you are aware, this pop-out right here is that very nice bay window that has that leaded glass in there in part of the library that's very important. We want to maintain the views out of that window as we come in. So that covers the landscape, and uh, we have questions later you can ask me, and I'll turn this back over to you. I'm actually going to uh, go back to the Century Plaza and just mention something that we probably glossed over and is probably important. As you come up that stair that, and ramp that Steve was talking about, you end up right here, and uh, this will be what we're calling a unified entry to the building on the upper level, and uh, so from this point, the library will be identified over to the right, and the uh, recital hall and art galleries will continue through the same entrance that they have right now. And so we literally flipped the entrance to the library so that we could unify the entrance as a way of uh, enhancing our wayfinding. And, uh, and there will be a signage program that gets developed as we continue with the design to uh, assist in that. And uh, so hopefully you uh, saw through this that the preservation of the landscape is as important to us as the preservation of the building. And uh, that this is a really great opportunity we, we think we have right now. Uh, this is a brief overview of the, the budget for the project. And it's about a $7.4 million budget all in. So uh, including every cost that uh, the city has, not only construction costs, but design costs, management costs, uh, move costs, et cetera. And uh, this is a, a rough breakdown of how those costs are uh, are uh, uh, being util how the budget is being utilized, and uh, and then the schedule. We are hoping to be done with our design at the end of this year um, and uh, go to bid, uh, take advantage of what is still uh, a favorable climate for bidding go into construction early 2012, and it should be a, approximately a 15-month construction. Uh, now, not to be unpopular at the end of my presentation here, but we do have to close the brand studio. We have to close the entire building during construction because of public safety concerns. Because of the way the building has evolved, everything is very interconnected. The electrical systems, the sprinkler systems, uh, the mechanical systems have a, a little bit of separation, but still some interconnection. Uh, there are some hazardous materials because of the age of the building, lead paint in the 1969 edition and in the mansion, uh, as well as some other things that we just can't have public around or employees around while uh, construction is going on. And so it is for public safety reasons that we do have to close the entire building down uh, or that we've recommended this. We, we did explore other options with public works and the library staff and all of those options expanded the schedule. Uh, you can't make as much progress as quickly, so it expanded the construction schedule out significantly, and it really increased the cost significantly because not only of the extended schedule, but of the things you need to do to protect the public and maintain temporary services. And so um, with that, I'd like to uh, ask for any comments or questions that you have. Uh, I know we do. Uh, comments, questions that we have at this time? I have one question, what sure. you said right at the end, um, what will happen to the employees? And Would, Well, that, I guess, isn't your answer. Yeah, that, that is unfortunately something I can't answer, but I know that the library staff and public works have been working very diligently to come up with answers on other lo places to relocate not only the library and the recital hall and the gallery, but also the brand studios uh, during this interim period. 
and uh, I don't know exactly. Yeah, I know that's not your, okay. that was just popped into my head. Yeah. When it, it's a great question and one that we uh, have been discussing at great length. Hi, I'm Elisa Resnick, an administrator at the library. The library staff will be either relocated to a temporary location, which we're still investigating if we're going to have one, and if not, they'll be probably integrated to the central library. I believe Joanne's report that's going to come after this will address the, the park oh, staff. Okay. Okay. I'm jumping here. Um, I had the, the uh, good fortune to attend the February 16th meeting oh, great. On, on brand, and so I just want to compliment you on being able to figure out something to do with the building to make it work from the library side. But I know that one of the problems that has always been been there from both parks and the library is this whole idea of how you find the entrance. Right. And I, I know you're, you're switching the entrance to the side, but can you talk a little bit more about how that's going to stop people from walking into the studios and saying, where's the library? Yeah, and, and we appreciate that. We've heard it in both directions. When we were doing our uh, investigation early on, we hear that people come to the gallery and go, where are the studios? And people go to the studios and say, can I leave my books here? And uh, that it's, it's really a pervasive problem. And uh, we have a wayfinding, a, a graphic signage um, program that uh, has not been completed yet uh, that will uh, provide enhanced wayfinding signage so that at the base of the stairs there will be um, much more visible, uh, clearer signage for what you go upstairs to find and what you go uh, to the north to find and so that the studio is more clearly defined as being to the north library and the recital hall and galleries are defined as more clearly up the stairs. And it's not uh, necessarily going to keep people from mistaking one place from the other, but we think it'll go a, a great direction to help in that by uh, really focusing the activities upstairs that we can uh, do a better job of getting people to have a more intuitive understanding of where to go in the building. Just, I... Um I really agree with your philosophy on landscaping. I think the, you know, the aesthetic beauty there is the building. I mean, it's a stunning building, and to have trees, even if they're jacaranda trees, covering it, it just doesn't make sense. Um, so, you know, we hate to see trees go, but when you have a building like that, you know, that's just the way things go. So, I and and trying to be sustainable and and also ficus. I, they're the bane of almost anybody who tries to grow, any, even if you're not growing. They're knocking walls over. They're, they're just not good trees. So I'm glad to see they're going. Thank you for that support. Yeah. Um, I have a few questions. The, um, I agree with the unified entrance uh, because going there now, I always, I always walk in the wrong way. And I, I don't know how many times I've been there, and I still do it. So that makes, that makes a lot of sense to me. One of the things that I've always experienced going there, too, is the restrooms. And I noticed that, I think I read later in the report, there was some funding issue about restrooms. Or Let me ask the question this way. Are we upgrading the restrooms at the facility as well? Absolutely. And uh, we, in consideration of your time, I didn't bring the full-on presentation that we uh, made to the uh, community in February, but the restroom uh, upgrade is absolutely a part of it, uh, both to make them accessible and to modernize them and Im improve the function of them. So yes, that is definitely a part of this. Okay. And uh, I agree also as it relates to the tree removal, but what I think would be helpful, because when you look at something real quickly and you see that there are some large mature trees that are going to be removed and some are dead and some are for view purposes and some are because they potentially have the ability to fall. I think if you did a list and you showed the species of the tree, you show the size of the tree, and you, you state why you are removing them would go a long way. Because then we can understand and say, or the council or whoever this goes to next, see they're removing that tree, this is why, yes, that makes sense. Okay, and we can certainly do that. That's not a problem at all. It's a good suggestion. The other thing, too, is, is other facilities, and, and I didn't read through there, but, and, and maybe it's not your question, maybe it's for the next segment, but you mentioned that the, the, the main body is going to be closed down, the studio, 
the library and the concert hall area. And I'm assuming that the tea garden and the doctor's house is going to remain open. Yes. And it's just going to be that core building that's impacted. That's right. And parking will still be accessible. Uh, there will undoubtedly be a need for a little bit of space of parking taken up for construction materials or, or something on that order, but not construction trailer. But in general, um, the park and the parking and all of the other activities in the park are unaffected by the work we're doing at this uh, during this construction period. So we'll have a, a fence around the property to as tight to the property as we can so that we're impacting as little of the rest of the park as possible, including the lawn in front of the library. I mean, there's no reason that can't fundamentally remain accessible except when we're replacing a tree or, or removing a tree. And then the last question that I had, and it's a little bit related to the architecture, you're talking about a seismic retrofit to the entire building. So are we going to now see plates and different things on the outside of the oh. building? No. What are we going to see? Uh, on the 1969 building, the connections of those big precast panels are going to be improved, reinforced, but from the backside. So it's a, a welding activity that takes place um, out of view, uh, out of permanent view. Uh, it is likely that we'll have to get into some of the ceilings in the brand studio in order to get to the connections around the base of those panels. And uh, we believe we can do that without any permanent impact. Certainly, if there's damage done to the ceilings, it'll be part of the contractor's work to restore it to uh, the condition they found it in. And uh, so that's what happens in the 1969 building. The 1904 building is uh, a little more complicated than that. The, uh, um, we're reinforcing the uh, diaphragms of the building, so the roof plane of the building as well as uh, some of the internal walls. And uh, there will be no visible impact on the outside of the building. None of those plates that you see uh, in uh, unreinforced masonry buildings, most of, because of the construction of this building, most of the important walls are actually on the interior. And uh, so we'll be doing work that is still being uh, developed by our structural engineer uh, to reinforce those walls and then plaster over them so that that reinforcing is not visible. Great. Thank you. Oh, what? One more question. We still I'm have sorry. more questions. I have one more question. Um, I just want to be clear that uh, the studios, when this project is complete, will have a new air conditioning system, a new heating system. That, that is part of it. They're on the same boiler, so the heating okay. system, absolutely. Uh, there's air conditioning system will be improved as well, yes. It's, there, there's shared services, so we can't help but uh, improve the things that are shared. So, absolutely. Thank you. Did staff have any questions? Did you guys have any questions? President Kahn, we do have a um, presentation of our own uh, to talk about some of the potential impacts of this project to the park operations. Um, um, so we can um, segue into that, or other than that, I don't believe we have further questions. Okay, great. Well, thank, thank you, you very, very much. much. Appreciate Exciting your time. Project. Thanks. Mm -hmm. President Kahn and Commissioners, uh, needless to say, there will be impact to some of the activities at, at Brand. Um, we don't look at too much impact throughout the park, however. This project's going to go on for over a year. So with 12 to 15 months is the anticipated time frame, it's going to definitely impact what goes on at that facility. Uh, the staging of the equipment, the staging of the contractor will play a big part in the parking. Now, Gary Morello and staff have assured us that we can probably do some good staging at the facility to try and minimize the impact of the parking. That will be a big factor. Um, the parking will affect every activity that goes on in that facility. Um, the sports leagues, there should be no impact. Parking's difficult anyway when you get a large group of sports teams together. So uh, that's, it's basically unaffected. Most of the lower lot is used for the parking for the sports. The summer day camp program, very little impact. 
Uh, we still can use our day camp area, which is in the back left side of the building. Uh, we have restroom and we have storage facilities there that have just been improved, so we're good there. Uh, and it's a drop-off for parents. Parents swing around and they drop their kids off, so there's really very little parking other than some staff that park in the lot. Uh, the hiking trails will be no impact at all. Everyone can still come to the hike, to take part in hikes. Special events can still take place. We do a lot of special hikes on the weekends. That's still going to be accessible. Um, the Japanese tea house and garden will still be available for events. The doctor's house will, of course, remain open, and there's events there. Usually every summer we have a lot of different things that happen at the doctor's house. Uh, so those shouldn't be impacted other than normal parking issues with the at the facility on a weekend, a busy weekend at Brand, because we still have picnics, people visiting the facility, but hopefully it'll be minimized uh, with the good staging of the construction equipment, so we should be good there. Probably the biggest impact will be for the Brand Studios, which is the recreation classes and the workshops that we have. Um, obviously, because it's closed, we have to move away. Uh, so, you know, the good signage that we hopefully will have up will we'll let people know where we're going to be. Um, the park maintenance staff will be fine. Uh, there, those should, there should be no impact to their yard. Um, they service at Section 2, I believe, Section 2, and Section 2, uh, they disseminate from there. They start there in the morning, and then they work their way out into the city. So they should be okay as far as their impact. Um, we, we, we are worried about uh, cancellation of classes, movement of classes, more than anything, the, the loss of instructors. Uh, when we're gone for a year and a half, we're, we'd like to try to keep everyone uh, contained as best as we possibly can, and we think we can. We've got the new Grand Manor opening up. We've got the Joe Bridges Clubhouse that uh, just got some air conditioning. And so we've got a few temporary locations that we can move some of the classes to. Uh, unfortunately, we've got some classes that just, if they move off that facility, we potentially will lose the instructors and the students because we deal with travel issues. We deal with, it's, it's community-based classes where the bulk of the class is from within the community, even though we serve a wide geographic area. So that's a good chance that we could lose the instructor and the instructor may find something else. But our goal is to contain it as much as we possibly can. We're investigating the use of uh, modulars. Um, and if we have modular units where we can have a, the, a large room where we can still have the activity, that would, be, that would be our goal, is to maintain the activity. Staffing may have to move away, and we may have to add staff to try to take care of the various locations, because we'll have to open closed doors, we have to do extra registrations, but we're prepared and willing to do that. This is a good project that, that should go forward. Uh, but the impact to having classes at the facility is, is an issue. We've come up with a couple options, as you saw in the report. Item one was to rent the modulars for the classrooms. That would be on site. We have an opportunity. We have two potential sites that we've looked at on, on Brand Park where we can put the modular. The, the parking would be okay. It would be very good accessibility one over the other site. And there, therefore, we have an opportunity to keep the classes on site, and it would be pretty much zero impact because the classes could continue as they are. Option two is probably our problem because option two says we have to move a lot of classes off site. And if we have to move, then we deal with the potential for classes going away. And so there's where we possibly have loss of revenue, loss of instructors, loss of participants and clients. Um, we hope to do what we can with our staff as far as keep them on site if possible, again, because the customer service office at Brand is, brings in the most registrations. Uh, that's just the place to go to register for classes and workshops and activities and find out about events in the city. So it brings in a lot of revenue. It, uh, Brand Studios itself generates a lot of revenue. So that's where we see our biggest impact if we cannot bring those modular units onto the facility. So we've, lo we've looked at other alternatives. The library uh, graciously offered us the possibility of classes, of classrooms, of using meeting rooms. But uh, unfortunately, some of the classes we have are ceramic type or painting, and we are going to be messy. And we will have, that we want to be able to store sometimes, and that might not be the possibility. Um, the, the numbers of students in the class might not be conducive to some of the meeting rooms. So we're still looking at that. We're still seeing how that might, we might be able to work that in. 
Um, we don't want to stray too far from brand studios geographically just because of the clientele. And uh, that, again, would impact the classes. Um, the customer service office at the Civic Auditorium will probably take the brunt of this because they will end up doing more and more registrations and class uh, uh, information giving out the and and so possibly some of our staff, staff may shift there to help out with that. So uh, all in all, it's a, it's a great project. We look forward to it coming to a fruition in uh, 15 months from the time it starts. Uh, it just will be an impact to us in how we're going to have to have to deal with it. Couple questions. Uh, you mentioned that if we can't bring the modular units on site. Why can't we bring them? Is it a cost issue, or is it what's the issue about bringing it on site? It, it would be a cost issue. It's the we we have not budgeted for this in the project. If it's if it can be budgeted for in the uh, the master project, great. Uh, we don't have that budget within our in ourselves, as far as I'm aware. Mr. President Khan, if if I may, these logistics are continuing to unfold. Um, we need to continue to analyze the different options or the different variations. Uh, we do anticipate making at least one, maybe two reports to the City Council, at which time we will be able to detail the additional costs that perhaps uh, weren't thought of at the inception of the planning of the project, you know, such as uh, any costs related to the impact to the Community Services and Parks Department. And uh, hopefully there will be not an opportunity, if logistically the modulars would work out, that we'd be able to get uh, the funding in order to be able to rent those. But it's, it's still unfolding. We're still having uh, discussions with uh, public works and engineering and, and, and the architect and the library division in, in terms of how we, we uh, address all of our respective issues. Because it, it certainly seems to make the most sense and seems most logical to have those units on site. That would the, be our preference. The question I have as it relates to the, the financing or budgeting or how, how are we paying for this entire project? Is that, where's the funding coming from? Um, I, I believe the library division would be best qualified to answer that question. I, I believe it's, it's general capital improvement project funding. Yeah, it's all um, capital improvement project funding that was set in place some time ago. <laughs> it's, it's changed amounts over the time. We um, do have a CDBG grant application in f that would help um, with the ADA restroom. So if we would get part of that, that would then reduce costs elsewhere. Um, the 7.4 million is actually very tight. <laughs> um, so it, it's difficult to manage um, the project, but we have continued. We've not gotten some grants that we've applied for through the state. So um, but we have that we have that money budgeted for that's yes. not going to be impacted no matter what goes on with anything else. It, it shouldn't. Um, the executives do review the CIP budgets, and so far it's safe. Um, okay. But it, I think everything is a moving target as far as that. So we're hoping because of the importance of the historic building and its relationship to Leslie Brand that it will be um, maintained and we can continue to go forward with the project. So if we added another $150,000 to the modular units, that wouldn't be something that you guys could absorb easily? It would then take away from, from something else in the project. Um, there's a small line item in the budget just for moving the library collections, and even that isn't enough. Um, the library continues to plan their 11-12 fiscal year budget and ideas of how we can have a temporary location and if we have a temporary location can we also accommodate the studios we think about those things all the time and like just said it's a constant um, discussion and <laughs> it's all part of our plans of seeing what will happen best and I think the 11-12 budget process will kind of maybe dictate where we go okay thank you mm -hmm. I think along the, the lines you were thinking, losing customers, I think, would be. My sense would be I'd settle for a few less amenities because some of those customers you may never get again. I mean, you spend years trying to get these classes um, go up somehow. Well, maybe, maybe that's a comment or a recommendation that we make that 
to, to us, if, if we all feel that way, it's a priority to have those units on site and try to figure out a way how to fund them. One just small other thought. That you talked several times about registration, and my technology spiel once again. Registration needs to be on the Internet. I mean, I think everybody uses the Internet. Be, there certainly ought to be a trend to have more and more things on the Internet, and forget about it. It's at Brand Park or the Civic Auditorium. Quite not to do that, but I could figure out. And we're working on that with our um, uh, IT people. We are constantly looking at a different way to register. Our Safari program is no longer supported by um, the company. So we are in the process of looking for another registration type program. So this may allow us to delve into that a little deeper and bring that to fruition because we need to find another program that will take us further on in what we want to do. That will help. Um, I just in the not the latest, but maybe one month old uh, parks NRPA. Uh, they had a, a city that has had a an application on the iPhone for doing this sort of thing. I don't even think that's forward thinking. I think anybody who's not thinking about putting an application on the iPhone isn't thinking. So uh, that might be another where we can do stuff. Right. Thank I'll you. I'd be happy to give you this. Thank you. Um, I, I kind of have to wear both hats here a little bit because I'm a parks commissioner now, but I was a library director for many years. And um, I just know from, from kind of both sides how well the staffs work together in trying to solve these problems. And I think that as they move forward, they will come up with, with a solution that will make sense both to parks because we really don't want to lose our customers. We, we want to keep that very successful program going, but that will also allow uh, the library to move ahead with this wonderful project. We've been working on this project since I was her director and I've been retired six years now. So, <laughs> so uh, to see this finally come to fruition and have such a, a wonderful project is is really exciting. So I'm I'm looking forward to it and as I say I I know how well the two staffs work together and I, I know they'll work this out great okay okay as we quickly move along thank you very much <laughs> uh, what's our next item 682 contract class annual report uh, and I'd like to introduce uh, Monique Herrera who will who's our community service supervisor at the brand studios Good afternoon, President Khan, commissioners, and uh, fellow staff. Um, I'm here just to give you a little brief overview of the lifelong learning program at Brand Studios for this past calendar year. Um, a little history item is uh, the contract class program started in 1950 at Fremont Park. There was a little room there back then. And then it transitioned to Brand in 1969, and we've had classes there all that time. I've actually been here 20 years and have been working in the classes for pretty much most of that time. Um, we offer classes um, at eight locations, not just brand, including Pacific, the Adult Recreation Center, the community buildings, um, Spar Heights, and the Glendale Sports Complex. We're hoping to offer classes at Maple and Griffith Manor um, upon their uh, completion of renovation, so we're pretty excited about that. We used to have classes at Griffith Manor before it was renovated. Um, typical classes that we offer are in certain categories as um, children's art, children's dance, children's fitness, visual arts for adults, um, fitness for adults, and special interest. Our two most popular categories are children's dance and adult visual arts. Um, as a supervisor at Brand, uh, we have the highest majority of registrations in the adult visual art classes because half of the classroom is all glass and the students like it because the lighting is so good in that room. Um, our current classes range uh, in fees from $30 from a one-day workshop to $130 and those prices are set by the instructors who are now city employees. Um, in this past calendar year, in 2010, we had approximately 2,000 students uh, in our winter, spring, summer, uh, and fall sessions. We offered over 500 classes, um, and we had an increase from 2009 of 242 participants. I attribute that to uh, other locations adding a few more classes, because at Brand, we're 
pretty full. We have classes six days a week. Um, winter is the typically the highest season for registrations. We actually don't know why, but we think it's that you know kids are now getting acclimated to the school year, and so parents have time to put them in in classes. Um, we recently converted our instructors uh, to hourly city workers, and so we're hoping that with these new locations coming on board, we can generate some more revenue to hire more instructors and offer more classes. Uh, we currently market our classes several different ways. Each facility markets them in the leisure guide, of course, but we put flyers at coffee houses, um, colleges that we work with, uh, and our instructors and, and myself, we work on flyers for them and they pass them out to their community. So we're hoping that after this uh, long renovation we'll be able to uh, bring in more classes. Some of our, our classes have been there for 40 years. Uh, we have st our students normally take four sessions a year, so it's the same student every year in the adult classes. Uh, so we're looking forward to the completion of the renovation so we can create more classes and hope we can build our program back up. If you have any questions, that would be it. Do we have questions? I do not. Great. Great Thank job. you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. What's next? 683 Community Buildings, Amenities and Services. And I would like to introduce Ross Ferris, our Community Service Manager. This is a report when uh, uh, Commissioner Rob Fogel asked about how do we talk about our buildings and how do we let the public know uh, about rentals. Uh, Ross is here to give us a report. Good afternoon, uh, President Kahn, Commissioners, Department staff. Uh, my name is Ross Ferris, and I'm the Community Services Manager uh, responsible for the Civic Auditorium, uh, Brand Studios, the Department's uh, Customer Service Office, and the Special Events Group. Um, I'd like to review the community buildings that we have today, uh, their amenities, their services, and how we let people know that uh, we're around and we're there. The Civic Auditorium uh, is at 1401 North Verdugo Road, and uh, it's the perfect venue for meetings, dinner dances, weddings, conventions, seminars, trade shows, concerts, and birthday parties. The amenities at the Civic, it's, they have very convenient parking. They, we have a state-of-the-art sound system, Wi-Fi connections, commercial full-service kitchens, equipment rentals, a full theater-type stage, and dressing rooms. A client at the Civic uh, can get the detailed event planning help, event uh, layout advice, logistics planning, catering services, sound technicians if they so wish, and the Civic operations personnel are always there during all events to make sure that the facility runs smoothly. The upper auditorium is 11,000 square feet and accommodates up to 1,100 people. It has a full stage and dressing rooms. The hardwood floors were put down in 1936 uh, and we work very hard to maintain them. Uh, they're, it's, it's, uh, it's actually, a, they're beautiful still. They need help, they're old, but uh, we, we, we truly think that they're, they're a wonderful addition to the facility. Also upstairs, we have the terrace room, which is a room off the main auditorium, which you can use for food service or other activities. And we have a full commercial kitchen. The picture on the upper left shows the upper auditorium as it was set up for a professional boxing event. In fact, we've had three of them up there in the last year and a half. The picture on the upper right shows the people waiting to get into the H1N1 flu shot clinic that we had with the County of Los Angeles uh, last uh, November 3rd. And the bottom two pictures are the upper auditorium as it's set up for a large dance. The lower auditorium is 12,000 square feet. It accommodates up to 6, 600 people. And the sunken parquet dance floor is extremely popular. The lobby, counter, and food service area uh, make this a terrific venue for wedding receptions and dinner dances. We also have a commercial kitchen and a full conference room. 
picture on the left shows the lower auditorium as it's set up for a wedding reception. The picture on the upper right is the parquet dance floor. And the lower right-hand picture is the, one of the two commercial kitchens in the building. People find out about the Civic through the Civic sales brochure, email notifications, our marquee, the department's marketing booth at public events, the city's website, and we have a very informative phone attendant. Next, we have Brand Park, which we have been talking about quite a bit today. The Brand Park Studios are at 1601 West Mountain Street and uh, feature the Brand Friendship Garden for weddings and photography, the studio itself for classes, parties, and seminars. We have open park space for filming and special events. At the Brand Park and Studios, we also have detailed event planning uh, assistance available for clients. And of course, their operations personnel are also there during events to make sure that things run smoothly. The picture on your left is the gazebo, which is uh, a, beautiful, uh, a beautiful thing. Uh, on the right is the brand uh, Friendship Garden. Both of these areas are used extensively for wedding receptions and photo, photo uh, opportunities. The brand studio building itself hosts special events, art workshops, small conferences and group meetings, and of course, as we discussed, the lifelong learning classes are held in, these, in, these, uh, in this building. The marketing for this facility is done through their sales brochure, the leisure guide, email, the department's marketing booth, the, web, the city's website, and this particular facility has an outdoor kiosk, which later on we're going to recommend for all of our areas. Spar Heights at 1613 Glencoe Way hosts a variety of senior programs and services, which include nutritional, educational, and social services, leisure activities, and special events. The facility accommodates 150 people. It has a multi-purpose room for classes, parties, meetings, lectures, and special events, a billiards room, an outdoor patio, kitchen, and stage. The picture on your left is the dining room with the stage. The picture on the upper right is the outdoor patio area. And the picture on the lower right is the multi-purpose room. Spar Heights Marketing is done with their sales brochure, the leisure guide, the department's marketing booth, and the city's website. The brand new Adult Recreation Center was opened last year. And this facility at 201 East Colorado provides senior programs and services that include health screenings, wellness programs, lifelong learning classes, recreational activities, and special events. The building accommodates 240 people. It has a multi-purpose room for classes, parties, meetings, lectures, and special events, an activity room, a lounge, fitness center, outdoor courtyard, kitchen, and meeting rooms. The indoor facilities, the upper left, is a, one of the new meeting rooms. The lower left is the billiard room. The upper right is the dining room. And the lower right-hand picture is the courtyard area in the center of the facility. <coughs> People can sit, relax, and socialize. Outside, we have an outdoor patio, which is pictured on the left. And to the right, there's an area to play chess. People know about the ARC through their sales brochure, the leisure guide, the department's marketing booth, and the city's website. Pacific Community Center at 501 South Pacific Avenue was opened September 3rd, 2003. And this facility has contract classes, neighborhood uh, special events, and drop-in programs for families in the area. The building accommodates 500 people, has five multi-purpose rooms for classes, parties, and meetings. 
This facility has a state-of-the-art computer lab, has a recreation room, gymnasium, outdoor picnic pavilion, outdoor patio, and the new pool, which is under construction, and will open on June the 4th. The picture on the left is the outdoor picnic pavilion. On the right is one of the meeting rooms. The upper picture is the gymnasium. And the lower picture is the recreation room. The pool, of course, is coming along. It will open, as I said, on June the 4th. And uh, there's a lot of people waiting for that to open. The Pacific promotional tools include their sales brochure, leisure guide, the, the department's marketing booth, the website, and there's a lot of interaction, of course, with Edison Pacific School, which is also part of that facility. The sports complex was opened in April of 1999. This 27-acre facility includes two artificial turf soccer fields, a baseball field, and two softball fields. There's a meeting room and a snack bar on also an outdoor patio. Convenient parking is available for athletic participants and scoreboards for use during all sports activities are there for their pleasure. The sports complex staff prepare the fields for games. They're also there during all events to make sure the facility runs smoothly. We have storage locations for team equipment and there's also audio-visual equipment available for meetings. These two pictures show one of the ball, the ball fields. The upper picture is the outdoor patio. The lower picture is one of the soccer fields. The sports complex uses their sales brochure, leisure guide, the department's marketing booth, the city's website, and they also have an interactive sports website to let people know about its many amenities. This picture of the sports complex is a little different view. The soccer fields are in the lower portion of your screen. The ball diamonds are in the upper portion of your screen. It's quite a complex. The Joe Bridges Clubhouse at Glen Oaks Park at 2531 East Glen Oaks Boulevard was renovated just about a year and a half ago. It has a maximum capacity of 100 people and has warming ovens, a refrigerator, sink, tables, and chairs, and it can be used for sp small special events, meetings, and meetings. The Dunsmore Park Community Building was renovated just about the same time as Glen Oaks. And this facility has two rooms available. that has a maximum capacity of 50 people. It also has warming ovens, a refrigerator, tables and chairs, and is used for small events and meetings. Maple Park is currently under renovation, and when it reopens, it will once again host community meetings, classes, drop-in sports, and drop-in sports programs. The picture on your left is uh, the present construction installing a window. Uh, the uh, picture on your right is the renovated gymnasium. The upper left picture is the outdoor picnic tables. And on the lower right, you can see the expansion, the building's expansion space, which will be completed soon. Griffith Manor is another park that's under renovation. And the target to reopen that is June 11th. The Griffith Manor Community uh, Services Building is pictured. And when completed, it will have a small kitchenette and will also host small events and meetings. In the future, uh, we would like to have a real good set of professional pictures uh, taken so we can update our brochures. We need to have regular promotions on GTV6. Virtual tours of each facility online would be great. Each site really needs a specific website. They call them mini uh, websites so people can go right to them. 
An outdoor kiosk at each facility uh, is highly recommended. And weekly ads in the local newspapers will definitely increase our presence. We are very lucky to have these facilities, and I thank you for your time today to let me go through them. Do you have any questions? Do we have any questions? Are, are those ideas in plan, or are they just things that you'd like to do? Or a mix of there are things we'd like to do, although some of them we've thought about more than others. Hopefully the Internet is one you've been thinking about a lot. Yes. Like the virtual tour and each one with its own website that's all linked together. Yes. The, 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 the Internet, the virtual tour and the newspaper ads are, in, in my opinion, the, the two that carry the most impact. Thank you. Hold on one second. Do we have rental rates as well online? Or does we do. We do have, I don't have them with me, but we do have rental rates. That. Yes. So, so if we go online and go to the website, we'd yes. be able to click on it and figure out what the rental rate rates is. are there. They're also in the leisure guide. Okay. Would you have availability online? That's I'm sorry? Would you have availability also online so you can see? We do not have availability uh, online. We're, also, we're going to have to get a new software system to do that. Um, if people want to know the availability of a rental facility, they uh, can call any one of the facilities. Um, and uh, they can pull it up while they're on the phone and, and uh, tell them whether they're, if they're available or not. The most common place to find that out will be the Civic Auditorium Customer Service Office. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. you did a nice job. Thank you. Thanks. Item 6A4A, under monthly activity reports, Park Services. President Kahn, Commissioners, my name is Gary Morello. I'm the Park Services Administrator, and I'd like to bring two items up. One, uh, the Shoal Canyon reforestation is, has moved forward finally. It took a long time, but it, the availability of plants and the uh, weather were both things that were stopping it, but now it's in its final stages. Next, present, next uh, Christian uh, meeting, I'll have a presentation for the entire project. It's all 95% it's completed. So I'm taking pictures of it as we speak, and it's being mulched over right now. And the last two trees or three trees went in yesterday, so or last week. So hopefully I'll have that all done for you for next uh, next next meeting. The other one is um, President Khan asked me to comment on a on a article about artificial turf, and uh, I read through it and made some notes. But uh, I'm going to keep my opinions to myself, and I'm just going to comment on what I what I read. Okay. <laughs> Um, BASF did the did the study, and they uh, they checked on three ca eleven categories. Um, when you compare artificial with with real turf, you can have a myriad of different categories. You can do almost anything you want. There could be thirty or forty categories. They picked eleven of them. Most of them, um, their energy consumption were a couple. Was the raw material consumption, greenhouse gas emission ozone depletion and risk potential. That's some of the ones they picked. Um, and about half of this I was in agreement when I read it and it looked reasonable. Some of it does not look that particularly reasonable, but some of the ones they forgot were um, the O2 production and the heat reduction of real grass as opposed to artificial turf. The O2 production 2,500 square feet of turf grass will give enough oxygen off for a family of four for a year. So on a daily basis, if you, if you have 2,500 square feet of oxygen and you have a family of four, that's producing what they need for the year uh, on a daily basis. Uh, there's other, other categories that I could go through. The other one that I want to spotlight is um, the heat. On a, on a day where it's 98 degrees, an artificial field can get up to, I believe, it's 168 uh, degrees on the, on the field itself. So right then and there, even if you put water on it, it's, it's extremely hot. People, and they talk about uh, the risk factors, and their risk factors in the article were pertaining to falls and that kind of stuff. This has got um, heat prostration 
added to it with, 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 with the lack of uh, real grass. Real grass would be anywhere from 20 to 30 degrees cooler from, let's say, a cement field, which would be less hot than that, that turf. That turf has, that artificial turf has plastic blades and black tire um, crumblings in it. Uh, there are definite ways or uh, places to use it. No, no, no two ways about it. The study, as I, as I see it, was incomplete. It didn't, have a, it didn't have enough categories in it. You can debate this till the cows come home, and you don't, you'll still have your, your preferences. But uh, I think you need to uh, add all the different categories to this to get a real a pro and con to see, how, uh, to see how it works. So it's a good article in the sense that it does bring up some things that uh, are, you know, are, are good for artificial turf. But uh, there are some things that are, that, that are con also on it, and it didn't, uh, didn't particularly address enough of those, I don't think, conditions. Well, I, first of all, I appreciate you doing that. It was an article, and I think I brought this up before. It was an article from our, we get a, a monthly, I think it's the National Parks, yeah, National Parks magazine that we all get uh, as commissioners, and I think staff gets it as well, I'm not sure. And so they, they had kind of elaborated on the benefits of this artificial turf and then also taken into consideration what we've been doing outside here at City Hall where there's little sections or little squares that we put out for people to come look at and sample and everything else. So it was kind of interesting. I'm glad that, that you did the research because to me you would know probably quite a bit, especially compared to myself. Uh, <laughs> As it relates to this, so so I, I appreciate the feedback, and then we'll just keep moving forward. I'm not sure what the status is of these squares and planning is the one that's spearheading that. I was just helping them pick a spot for it, but uh, they haven't made a decision. Um, I, I don't think the city council has taken it up yet as far as how they want to approach this. It does have, like I said, it has some real possibilities, some real pluses. Uh, median strip that you want to keep green. You don't have to water. Water doesn't run off into the street. Even your front yard, if it's a little tiny piece the size of this little courtyard here area, would be fine. Uh, but anything substantial would would be personally, like I said, I try to keep my personal feelings out of this. But I think that like. Uh, in, uh, in hot climates, especially this the area that we're in right now, the desert areas, there are grasses that will take less water than what we use out here and produce the oxygen, produce the cooling effect. Sure. And you can easily get from the air temperature 20 to 30 degrees cooler from what it is. So if the air temperature is 115, you're down to about 90. Yeah. And it's, it's, a, it's a substantial reduction in, in in cooling costs and heating costs, again, those could be categories that you could see how much a home would use if without without turf like that. Sure. But again, it, it has a, and the sports sporting, you, you know, yeah, you can play in frozen weather, you can play in rainy weather, you can play in all kinds of inclement weather, and you can't really do that on on regular turf because you just tear it up. I think it's more just educating ourselves, and then we make a decision. Yeah, I think so. so. Great, thank you. You're Thanks welcome. for doing that. Item 6A4B, Recreation and Community Services. Uh, before you, you have the activity report for Recreation and Community Services. Um, one thing that we would like to highlight is our Winter Wonderland event, uh, which is not in this report, but this is a large event that takes place at Brand, and Karen Fries will make that presentation. Freeze Wonderland. President Kahn, members of the commission, yes, Karen Freeze, the appropriate person for Winter Wonderland. Um, unfortunately, Patty Betancourt, who coordinated this event, could not be with us today, so I'll be giving a brief presentation. And I'd like to thank Iris for helping us put together our PowerPoint presentation. Uh, this was our 32nd annual Winter Wonderland, and it was held on Saturday, February the 12th from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. And one side note, I was there for the first annual Winter Wonderland. So this has been going on for a long time. 
and is well received by our community. Uh, this year we had an estimated 4,000 children and adults attend and um, wide range of ages all the way from tiny tots to grandparents and yes some of our uh, grandparents did indulge in going down the snow slides and playing in the snow and s throwing snowballs so it's always good to have them out. All of the Winter Wonderland activities do take place on the west side of the park and we have 60 tons of manufactured snow which comprise our two play areas and our four snow slide areas and this year thanks to Chris Peplo who's our parks manager at that facility we had a curved slide for the first time and that was extremely popular with all of the attendees um, we are fortunate to augment this event every year with volunteers and this year we had 44 volunteers from Glendale High School and Hoover High School and we also had an additional seven adult volunteers who assisted the event. Um, this year the groups that were represented and helped out with this event were the Jewel City Kiwanis Club, the Glendale Crescenta Valley Red Cross, youth programs, Community Planning Department, Community Services and Parks Marketing Booth, Integrated Waste Management Program, the Glendale Rocks Climbing Wall, the Glendale Public Library Bookmobile, our Park and Play um, Mobile Recreation Unit, the Glendale Water and Power Department and Neighborhood Services. And I did want to comment that uh, Norma Vias was here a couple months ago commenting on the Glendale Rocks Climbing Wall and Park and Play Party Package. And one of the things that she did with her staff is bring those units out and not only were the children playing on them at the event, but that was a great marketing tool to get the word out. And she did get several people who are des desperately interested in having both of these units out at their personal uh, entertainment parties. So that was a great thing to be able to market some of those. Um, we did have great coverage in our Glendale News Press and they did get a lot of mileage out of the photos that they took. I think they were available for almost three weeks after the event. So really great support by our community and I want to thank all of you for your continued support for this event. Are there any questions? I just want to say I think I might have been at that first one also. <laughs> it's, a, it's a great event. <laughs> Well, it's interesting. Uh, we went from five tons of snow that first year and one slide on the west side um, to now over 60 tons of snow with a lot more activities. So uh, it's been great to see the growth of this event and uh, the fact that we continue to have a lot of support by our community uh, is really a wonderful thing for us. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. 6A4C CIP projects. President Kahn, members of the Commission, I'll just briefly uh, summarize some of the key things that we've been working on since our last meeting. Uh, Maple Park, as you know, is moving toward completion. We anticipate that we'll um, reach substantial completion on that project at the end of March sometime in April and then we'll be doing the all the residual cleanup work uh, fine-tuning all the interior improvements establishing landscaping testing training staff getting furniture delivered and um, I expect that facility will probably be ready to come online April, May, probably May. We'll, we'll get a firm date on that uh, before we uh, make an official announcement, but looks like the first part of May at this point. Uh, assuming we get the furniture delivery, that's kind of the last piece that we're waiting on. Uh, Pacific Park is moving forward uh, on schedule. It's a very aggressive schedule, uh, but we anticipate opening that facility June 4th kids in the water on June 4th. That's our motto. <laughs> so, and the mayor. Congress has been amazing. I, yeah. I, it, just, 
It is. There, it is really moving, moving fast, and uh, it's a tribute to the contractor and to the project managers, Peter Verheilich, Haga, Sean Toro, who are out there taking care of it every day, making it happen. Just really first-class people. Griffith Manor Park is m moving along. Um, poor project. Every time we open up a piece of the earth, the skies open up uh, at the same time. And so it, it appears we may have two two pull projects at this point, <laughs> uh, one unplanned. Um, but the building is coming along quite, quite nicely and uh, fine-tuning some of the improvements out there. It's really going to be uh, just a wonderful improvement for that area of our community that for a long time had a park that was really in need of, of upgrading. So that's a big uh, that's a big lift. That'll be open in June as well. So we'll probably have ribbon cuttings um, for Maple in May, Pacific and Griffith Manor in June. We will finish the seismic work at the barn in May. Uh, that won't be a grand opening because it's just the seismic work. We don't have the funding for the other improvements that are needed up there uh, at this point, although we do have grant applications in, and we're hopeful that those may uh, be successful. Um, probably the best news uh, that I can give you and that I've had in my three years in this department is that we actually started work on Riverwalk uh, this month. Uh, Remarkable star cross project that uh, has actually gotten underway. Many, many challenges with that project. John Pearson has, has the patience of an oyster. Uh, he has stayed with it and. Uh, Pearl of a guy. Heard that? Yeah. Pearl of a man. <laughs> That's good. <yes. laughs> I've never heard that used before. Yeah. It's actually very good. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's illustrative, uh, to be sure. Um, in any event, we've uh, been working, as you may know, the, the project, uh, the last meeting on it with council was a bit contentious with one group of neighbors uh, strongly in favor of the project, another group of neighbors strongly opposed to the project. Um, council directed us to move forward with the project as planned and work with the neighbors. We have, and now those neighbors who were opposed to it are practically part of the project team. Um, mm -hmm. We've done some fine tuning to design things that were of concern to them um, and been meeting with them out on the site, talking with them. We've met the cats, the dogs, the horses. Uh, it, it is no oysters out there, although we <laughs> haven't checked the riverbed. Um, you know, it's, it's a possibility. Um, but it's really one that's come full circle, um, and I think we all see that this project is going to meet their needs. And there were some fine-tuning uh, things that we could do that we weren't aware of that uh, were of concern to the residents. And although we'd have many meetings, uh, none of those issues had come up. Uh, what were some of them, Dave? Moving a fence, putting in a gate, um, switching out the location of one corral with a seating area to reduce dust adjacent to their swimming pool. We'd met with people for three years on those things and had never come up. Uh, never got past, we don't want the project. And um, Now we're, we're beyond that and... Uh, looking at other options out there in terms of connectivity with Betty Davis Park and the dancing that bridal trail there and, and those things. So again, uh, John has just been phenomenal in his ability to sit and listen and be thoughtful and responsive to the needs of the community. The uh, owner of the apartment building, um, Ring, called and for a few days and said, you folks are welcome to use my property to access your site, come on any time, and we're really excited by the project. I, I thought it was Jess Duran giving me a crank call. But <laughs> as it turned out, it was a real call, and uh, I just, just a complete 180 and a credit to Mr. Ng and to all the residents for the, their willingness to sit down and, and think through things and make some adjustments that 
weren't um, their first choice, but now I think we're seeing a project that's um, got some real potential. And then the next phases of it that Mark Sturdivant and John have worked so hard on, which are the bridge components connecting to Griffith Park, and that will really make this um, just a remarkable amenity. And adding that equestrian component helps strengthen the fabric of that equestrian zone there. It creates an equestrian amenity that really will uh, be uh, good for that neighborhood in terms of strengthening that connection between a equestrian property with convenient and safely located equestrian improvements. So that's just really probably the shining star of things that have happened in the first quarter of this year. Hard to imagine it's already uh, headed toward April. Maryland Avenue Park, we're getting ready to go into design review on. We'll be releasing the EIR on Columbus Soccer Field in April. Uh, first, we'll take it to the Environmental Planning Board as is required. Uh, they will review it for completeness and then authorize us to, uh, presumably, they will offer, authorize us to release it to the public. We will then uh, commence an extended uh, public comment period. We're required to do a 30-day period. Uh, we'll do a 45-day period instead to provide folks a little more time. We'll make the EIR available at the libraries. So it'll be available on the website. Uh, you can buy a disc for the cost of producing the disc or the hard copy if you want it, which is a little more expensive. Um, we will... Um, have a c additional community meetings, take public comment, respond to comments, edit uh, the IR in its final draft form, and then get it to the council with the planning department probably in July. And then assuming council adopts the EIR, uh, that would become final and we would move forward with the design phase of that project. Start construction of that project the summer of 2012 when school is out built during that. We're hoping to get under construction on the tennis courts at Glendale High this summer when school is out. We had some delays with the state architect's um, review of the project and those delays then compounded the schedule in that even though we were done we couldn't move forward with construction because school had started again. So that put us back a year on the project. Car park design for security improvements and lighting is in progress. Uh, we should be uh, getting close to uh, something to bring to the commission and the council here before June. That's, uh, that's going to be an exciting design because it's the entryway, the gateway to the city from Eagle Rock. Uh, so that security fencing will not only be a security element, it will be a design entry statement into the park, so it's a chance to incorporate. And speaking of art, um, one of the, the commissioners served, uh, Commissioner Bennett served on the art committee at, at the commission's uh, request. Uh, is that the right word, request? Um, and perhaps Commissioner Bennett would like to tell you about the uh, art selection process. Well, we actually did, I did talk about it oh, earlier. You did. Um, when you were out getting some oysters for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. I, um, <laughs> questions about that? I mean, I think I, since we haven't made selections that has to go yeah, to right. the council, I, I wasn't overly specific. Um, but hopefully that's going to occur within a week and we're going to get some do you, Did you choose, what, two or three of them to choose from, or do you choose one and then well, recommend them? the way it originally started was the budget was going to allow for for just one, and they so everybody sort of submitted. I think it was twenty five thousand dollars worth of art, um, and we're hoping maybe to get more than one. And so we've had multiple meetings. The first one was to select one piece of art. Then, when there thought might be there might be some more money available, we had an additional meeting in which we selected multiple pieces to make sure that they all would sort of fit together. And interestingly enough, some of the art is actually functional. Um, so we definitely want to, it was not only a nice piece of art, but it would also function sort of as like a, oh, and, and it was all first class stuff. Oh, nice. It's been a great process. 
Dave, what's the date of the council meeting to review the Maple Park? Well, we hope Maple it's Park. the 29th, but I'm not. Yeah, it, it's gotten bumped off the calendar. Um, so I think we're looking at a April 5th date, but that is, I believe, election day. So that might go to the 12th. Heck, one of the pieces, now that I think of it, was not only for Maple, but it was bike racks that were so clever we thought we might have them all over the city, particularly since we're trying so that process, and Ripsome worked on that. Audrene Galnazarian, who's managing Maple Park and has done just from the few shots you saw in the earlier yeah. pride slide presentation, she's done a remarkable job done. George Volterra, just really hardworking, first-class people that are doing a great job. And you'll see the results at the, at the ribbon cuttings. Um, so those are all... All the key things. One last thing, you know, Mark Sturdivant, Jeff Weinstein, and myself, along with Dottie and, uh, and Laurel, and, and many others have been working on this Run the Verdugos 10K run sponsored by our department and by the Parks Foundation. So uh, I think Mark told us today they have 106, 176 runners uh, mm -hmm. officially registered for the race. Uh, we had our first day of training um, yesterday at Brand Park at 8 a.m. in the rain. Uh, we had uh, about eight people show up and brave the elements, and we did a 35-minute walk, 40-minute hike. Uh, so we will be there at Sunday mornings at Brand Park in the upper parking lot by the doctor's house at 8 o'clock uh, between now and May 1st every Sunday for training. And each Sunday we add five to 10 minutes to the walk or to the run. We've got multiple groups, so uh, I lead the very slow walking group. <laughs> and Eric has the pleasure of leading the run group, and then we have other folks in the middle. So there's always room for more uh, at Brand Park at 8 o'clock on Sunday mornings. How long do you go for, Dave? From 8 to what, 9? Uh, well, it'll expand. Right now it's about 8 to 9, and then each Sunday we're adding about 10 minutes. Uh, to the walk or to the run. So the whole thing is based on time. So we started with about a 40 minute, 35, 40 minute walk. So next week we'll be 50, then we'll go to 60 and work our way up. On May 1st, we have the actual race. So uh, folks uh, should be ready to uh, complete the 10K. It's a challenging uphill course. If folks want more information on it, they can get it on the web page, www.runtheverdugos.com. Just a, really a great, great first time out event that's uh, really coming along uh, spectacular fashion. It's our first annual. First annual, yes. Take, take on the mountain, and it's exciting. We even have some Glendale firefighters training to uh, take on the mountain, so thank you. This will be one in a row. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thank you very much. Actually. 6A4 DCDBG program. Uh, President Khan, <clears throat> uh, before I give a very brief um, update on the CDBG program, I do want to take a minute to thank uh, Dave Ahern, Gary Morello, and Joanne Vendito for the work that they do day in and day out, for the leadership they display, for the quality of work they do, the quality of the reports that you receive on a monthly basis, and um, how, how they lead the, uh, uh, the staff. Um, and you know, being appointed as, as the director, there is no way that I, I can do this uh, without their continued support and my quality and commitment to the job. Uh, we provided you, as part of the Community Development Block Grant Report, a, a copy of the list of recommendations that have been developed by the CDBG Advisory Committee for fiscal year 11-12. Uh, the committee received 29 funding proposals. Uh, the committee in interviewed each of the 29 um, applicants on February 25th during an all-day session, and again on March 3rd during a half-day session. Uh, overall, 24 fund. Uh, excuse me. Overall, 22 social service proposals were recommended for funding, and five 
and, and four proposals were, were recommended for um, capital improvement projects. So 22 for social services and five for capital improvement projects. Um, these recommendations will be going before the City Council on April 12th. Um, like, like the threat to the redevelopment funding from the State of California, as you may know, uh, Congress is, as we speak, also deliberating significant cuts to the Community Development Block Grant Program, other housing programs, and uh, homeless funding. Uh, the worst case scenario that's, that has been proposed and actually passed by the uh, Congress, but will not be passed by the Senate, fortunately, is uh, a 50 or 60 percent cut to the Community Development Block Grant Program, which would be significant. It, it would virtually change what we're, what we're able to do um, in the community. Um, so we're anticipating a some level of cut, uh, you know, something that's a lot more manageable. Uh, but if it is significant, we'll have to regroup and go back to the advisory committee and uh, um, look at some revised recommendations and do a revised report to the city council. As of now, these are the re recommendations that will be. When will you know when it gets adopted or when does it get adopted? We will probably know in, in about a month what, what, what the cuts will be. I had a question about some of this, the, the funding recommendation. Who would I ask that to? Is that, are we going to get a presentation or is that what you just did or? Yeah, this is the report. I just gave you the report. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Very nicely done. <laughs> Uh, I, I did have a question, though, and, and I noticed, and it was one of the questions I asked, um, there was four, or, I'm sorry, five funding proposals for capital improvement, or six, I'm not sure five, which one. Five, right. Oh, and then, six last year. And then the one related to what we saw today, which was the brand library upgrades, was not, was not funded. Was that discussed and deliberated or is there a reason that it wasn't funded or yes the CDBG advisory received a proposal from the library division to use the CDBG funds to pay for the ADA improvements um, the advisory committee um, uh, deliberated and uh, determined that um, we, we only had three hundred and thirty two thousand dollars available for uh, departments and community agencies, and so the committee determined that the committee projects uh, were a higher priority. And there was probably probably the notion that with a seven million dollar uh, budget for the library project, that that you know, there must be a way to be able to got the funding needed for the ADA um, improvements. Um, and in addition to that, as I mentioned earlier, the library division will be m making least one report, maybe a few to the City Council to talk about um, the budget and some of the budget issues. And, and so the committee hoped that at that time they'd be able to also get additional funding they might need for the AD. So then when we heard the presentation today, they gave us a dollar figure and I asked, did that include the ADA? And she said yes. It wasn't counting on this money then. Uh, to be honest, President Khan, I, I wouldn't be able to speak for them. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if they were counting on it or, or not factored It was part it. of 7.4. She had it as a line item. Mm -hmm. So it is part of it. Soon. They didn't say that they, well, there was some money that was contingent. Yeah, and, it's and, tight, though. It's and, and, and the recommendations have been published, so, so you're probably right. She's probably already, they've probably already factored that. That, that's fine. I'm just one of the things that when you go up to that facility, you notice is the restrooms are so short, you know, narrow and tight and everything else. I'd rather them, if if that funding got turned down and they, you know, kind of what we were talking about earlier, if they needed to shift some funding within the project to make sure that got done, that would that would be a recommendation. That would make a lot of sense. Yes, I'm I'm sure that's what they're going to do. That actually has to be done when you're renovating. Right. You have to bring it up to ADA you have standards, to that. so that will be done one way or the other. It would be something else in the project that would end up being cut if they didn't have. That's fine. Yeah. Yeah. 
we we don't have a choice. Thanks. Six A four E workforce development. Good afternoon, uh, President Khan and commissioners. Um, I think in your report, um, I pretty much summarized the accomplishments that uh, workforce has had. <clears throat> excuse me over the past uh, year, but one thing I did want to uh, mention was uh, something that uh, Jess touched on earlier, and that's the uh, federal budget. We're pretty much dependent uh, totally on uh, what happens with the federal budget, and unfortunately the uh, House of Representatives had uh, proposed and passed uh, the elimination of Workforce Investment Act funding completely. So that would uh, eliminate our funding, eliminate uh, workforce development uh, across the country. What's a little ironic is that uh, since the start of the recession, uh, the demand for our services has basically tripled. And um, the results that we've achieved have been pretty, uh, in my opinion, spectacular because uh, right now there are five uh, job seekers across, across the country for every uh, job opening that exists. And through the one-stop centers and the WIBs across the country, uh, one out of every two people that uh, come through the doors uh, lands a job. So uh, it's unfortunate uh, what's happening. Um, we'll try to keep you updated as we learn more. There's a lot of political lobbying that's occurring uh, and the Senate and the House are trying to work out some type of agreement. Um, I know uh, the President and Senate leaders have said there are certain programs they consider untouchable. At this point, we're not sure if uh, the workforce funding is one of those uh, areas. So uh, as things happen, we'll be sure to keep you uh, updated on that. Okay. If you have any questions, we'd be happy to. You guys have questions? Great. Thank you. Okay, thanks, John. Item 7 is written communications. I don't believe we have any. Any other comments? Or? I just have an announcement. Uh, Cesar Chavez event is going to take place this Saturday. Rain or shine. No, not this Saturday. Yes, this Saturday. Oh, I'm sorry. I've got my weeks mixed up. March 26th at uh, Pacific Community Center. So rain or shine, we'll be there. Free food. Time is 10 to 2. Uh, food served approximately 12 o'clock, and it'll be a very nice event. And hopefully, it will be sunny and we'll have a lot of activity and we squeezed onto those basketball courts because of the pool construction. But find us, we're there. Look for balloons, look for all kinds of uh, tenting going on. So we'll be there with all kinds of activities. Great. Food was good last year. And then April 5th. We encourage people to get out and vote. Get don't out we? and vote. Get out and vote. Great. Okay. Thank you very much. We're adjourned. <laughs>